the thing that we have to do is to create in our professional settings, here are people talking about their field. You know, we're physicists standing around in this room drinking a drink, but we're also queer. That gives a sense of safety. I can be successful in my profession, I can be queer, and I can be out here flying my rainbow flag with all the other people who appreciate it. My name is Sebastian Lorido. I'm currently a member of the Whitehead Institute and member of the faculty in the Department of Biology. As I've been meeting some of the other queer faculty, I've found a community and I think a shared identity with them. I would say, however, that there are many spaces within the academic institution where one can feel like the only one from no malice or ill intention, but simply because it's not an experience that everyone's familiar with. Hi, I'm Tuna. I'm a fifth year graduating PhD student from Material Science and Engineering Department, and I have been co-president of LGBTQ grad with Jack and Miranda for more than three and a half years. As a queer PhD student, I have been looking for a faculty role model, and in scientific academia, it is not easy to find queer faculty. Because of that, it has been precious and unique to be interviewing these brilliant faculty who are not just incredible in their fields, but also open and proud about their identities. I'm Lorna Gibson. I'm in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at MIT on the faculty. So I came out in the mid-90s. You know, I remember being nervous about telling people I didn't know any other gay faculty. Not, well, I knew some in humanities, but not, not in engineering. The thing I was most nervous about wasn't my colleagues, it was the students. I was nervous the graduate students wouldn't want to work with me. And I thought, ah, what am I going to do for my research if graduate students don't want to work with me? That's a big problem. But what happened in the end was MIT was negotiating the Singapore collaboration at that time. They were just starting that up. And I wasn't very happy about it because I didn't like the way Singapore treated gay people and their laws about gay people. And I wrote an article for the faculty newsletter about that. And that was kind of how I came out in a public way at MIT. But the thing has been that the students have been terrific. And my colleagues have been great. And I have to say, I think MIT has been very supportive of gay faculty and, and students. So I'm Nergis Mavlovala, and I'm a professor of physics here at MIT. And I'm actually currently serving as the dean of the School of Science. Speaking about my experience as a queer person at MIT, it comes in a couple of chapters. And the reason for that was when I was a graduate student in the mid-1990s, it was a non-experience in the sense that I, I faced no obstacles in being a queer person at MIT, but I didn't know anyone else like me. It would be really good for students to be able to be advised by, by faculty members who kind of relate to their issues. You know, when a student talks to me about coming out, I get it. I just get it. And for someone else who hasn't been through that process, of course they can get it, but it's from a distance. And they have to work at it, whereas I just get it. Uh, my name is Brian Bryson. I use he, serious pronouns. I'm an associate professor in the biological engineering department at MIT and a core member of the Reagan Institute. Four score and a million years ago, I arrived at MIT with uh, two duffel bags and a dream. I was so excited to come to college. So I went to MIT for undergrad. And coming from Texas in particular at the time, like I remember vividly like traumatic experiences like of people like pulling me out of the closet when I wasn't ready to be like teachers outing me and like in weird ways. And and so like coming to my tea and feeling like I had control over my own identity was really valuable. I met the queer faculty socially, right? I would just be like, oh, I'm at MIT. Do you know anybody at MIT, right? Like I would just like really reach out to my social network. That has been, it's like the hunt for my long lost family members at MIT. I'm certain I don't know a lot of them, but I do, I know a good number, right? I can, I can be like, I'm having a dinner party and I'm only inviting queer faculty and I will have 10 people in the room. Hello, I'm Miranda Dawson. I'm a PhD student in biological engineering at MIT and I'm a bisexual woman. Before coming to MIT, I had some preconceived notions about what to expect, mostly based off of what I had internalized as a stereotypical scientist. And um, 
it was actually kind of funny because in the first week of grad school, I went to the Pride Welcome, which is an orientation event for queer PhDs that are incoming. And it was pleasantly surprising to realize that almost a third of the cohort in my department were queer. We all just kind of looked at each other like, oh, this is pretty neat. <laughs> and I had never experienced that kind of community before. Hello, my name is Jack Foreman. I'm currently a PhD student at the MIT Media Lab and Center for Bits and Atoms. And at MIT, I've been incredibly supported by my friends, my colleagues, my advisor, to the point where I feel comfortable not just bringing my queerness uh, to my workplace, but also to my work. And so that means, you know, leveraging the fashion, the theatricality, the aesthetics that's so deeply rooted in queerness, but then using that as a way to create visually compelling ways to communicate my research or to be able to present it in an engaging way. What's been really wonderful about this whole experience is realizing that my identity as a scientist and my identity as a gay man are not contradictory, but complementary. And I'm just very thankful to have found a work environment that empowered and encouraged me to find that and be able to tap into it and let it improve my work. Um, I say this thing to people is I don't perform like traditional MIT drag, like I perform Brian. I actually remember my first semester teaching and I remember like walking in the first day, I was like, oh goodness, they have to take me seriously. And so I was like, oh, okay, Brian, we're gonna work on the wardrobe. Let's drop these skinny jeans. Let's do some relaxed fit. I remember walking out of the first day of class and being like, I want to vomit, right? Who was that character? That character was not me, right? I was like, there is no way that this is a sustainable function for a semester, much less a career. And so I just decided that like, nope, I'm not gonna manage my voice. I'm not gonna manage my attire, right? I'm not gonna manage my flourish. I'm not gonna manage any of that. I will tell you the most affirming comment that I ever received actually came from that semester of teaching where I was like, I was petrified, right? Just remember opening it up you know, like I can look at my course reviews and the first like written feedback was, yes. And I was like brought to tears. And I just remember like thinking, like sitting next to my department head the next day who I knew had like read the feedback and all I wanted to do, I was like smiling. I was like feeling myself. And then he finally mentioned, no, oh, I saw your course feedback. And it like, it took all of the self-control in the world to not just respond, yes. So, yeah. I think by necessity, many individuals in the queer community, particularly in kind of previous generations, have had to separate their professional and personal lives in order to find professional success. I think as there has been a kind of a lot of cultural progress in this domain, queer identities have come much more into the mainstream. It becomes easier to fuse those two together the way that they've always been fused for heterosexual individuals. Science is a human pursuit that is informed by our very own biases and how our ability to kind of keep expanding our imagination as people is in fact central to our ability to expand our imagination as scientists. Every single type of diversity can add to that endeavor can challenge our way of thinking and our way of understanding the world and can hopefully encourage us to identify those new perspectives to bring into the work that we do. What advice would I give? I would say like assimilate only in your excellence. You can just be you, the excellent scientist, but that excellent scientist can come in any shape, color you see fit and you can change that, right? and you get to choose what that looks like. The institution does not get to choose that for you. And so what I realize for me is like, I just have to remind myself how I got here and how I have that energy to continue to propel me forward. And I also realize that like, you have to also find your people. You have to find advisors who understand you or endeavor to understand you as a human being. If they're not, they're not for you. I always tell people like, how do I know if a lab is a safe space? Look at their website. Their websites speak volumes. Just look at the lab photo and don't think you're going to be the pioneer. Oh, I'll make it different. I'll make it different. No, don't do it.
right? It's like not worth, it's not worth your energy, right? They can be brilliant in a particular sense of the science, but like they're clearly failing in some departments. And then the other thing I'll, I'll say is for those of us who do have the choice to, to go to places that will treat us well and where we'll be safe, we use that privilege to help others get there and to also make other places safer. Those are the things that we should be working towards.